All good. So you should now online, you should be seeing the introductory slide. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us and making your way back after the fire alarm, coming back in from the sunshine. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Alfredo Ortiz, who is a great, um, he's he's both a an alumno, alumno, alumnus of IDS, um, having done his PhD here. Uh, he's also a, a great um, treasured colleague, um, much loved colleague of ours, um, a kind of at the participation class in particular. He's he's been working on action research for a number of years. He's contributed a lot to the Action Research Journal, and he also um, edited, co-edited a section of the of the SAGE Handbook that some of you may know of, the, as the SAGE Handbook of Participatory Research and Inquiry. So there's a whole section in there that Alfredo um, curated together with Mary Bryden Miller. Anyway, without further ado, I'll let Alfredo introduce himself much better, and um, thank him very much for being with us today. Thank you, dear. I think I have, I think I have this. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, and um, uh, I love being back here um, because I get to be more nerdy in a good sense and have conversations about in between things that you know I don't get to have in other places. Um, even uh, so, I also was fortunate to be in, invited to co-author the fifth edition of the book called Action Research with Ernie Stringer, um, which I loved. I learned a lot, but because it's for an overall audience we can't really go deep into multiple ways of knowing and just really interesting ways of working with people um, that I care more about. So um, I, I look forward to spaces like the Sage Handbook and um, conversations like this, where I can really go into deeper things that are more, that are also meaningful to me. Um, so welcome to this IDS member seminar. It's entitled the 500 Hats of the Action Researcher. And we'll see that we're using hats as a metaphor for roles and uh, the, the basic idea is that the things we actually do in the field are not the things they train us for. And so uh, we're trying to figure out, with, with certain exceptions, like fabulous programs like MAP. Uh, but but it, it, is, it is an exception, actually. <clears throat> it is an exception. And um, those of us who come to IDS, uh, we, we, people who, who, who end up here, they already showed up inspired, to be clear. Uh, you know, there's a certain self-selection of people that really are trying to change the world in some way that end up in a place like this. But certainly this place brings it out much more in us. And then we go back into the world and uh, into what we call adverse territories and some other work that I've done uh, that are very conservative in terms of how they understand methodology and, and how they understand research. Um, and so um, it's it's nice to be able to, to refresh that um, as we try to figure out how we can do the work that we need to do and actually get training for it. So when I when I go, when I'm in my program, I teach. And I'll, I'll introduce myself properly uh, in, in a second here. But when I when I'm uh, teaching the PhD students in my school of education at the University of Incarnate Word, um, I'm finding myself stuck having to teach a lot of courses that are not that useful to them and not teach them things that would be useful to them. So I'm trying to figure out uh, in a project I'm working on. What would that curriculum look like that's closer to what we actually do and that's closer to what people actually need? Because one thing is a step forward to reflect the work that action researchers and other kind of activists, community engaged researchers do, but that's not to assume that we do the right things either. So also design a curriculum that's based on what do people actually want to need and is that the same thing as what we do? Um, but whatever that is, it's different from what most of the traditional uh, programs um, that are out there focus on because they start from academic assumptions around you got to learn research, 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 and that's a narrow way of thinking, and it doesn't usually leave space for all the things we actually do. So uh, I'm not going to give a full version of this. I, I did give a full version of who I was in the previous session. I know this is a different group, um, but it just you feels like you know you're repeating yourself sometimes. But I just share very briefly that. Um, I'm from Northern New Mexico, uh, soy Chicano, Mexican American. I identify as Chicano. Um, and I, I, uh, this is a picture of uh, where I grew up in a little town called Pohuaque in the north of Santa Fe, which is the capital. And this is us um, 
harvesting chili. Uh, we, we eat a lot of chili, green and red chili. Um, it's our main food. It's the main source of our food year round. And we, um, uh, we, we roast and peel. So we, uh, we, in Spanish, we say, lo rescoldamos y lo, lo pelamos. Like we, we um, heat roast it, peel it, uh, core it, and then freeze it for year round use. So each, each family in my family eats about this much green chili per year per family. So about three uh, bushel baskets. I don't know if we're still using bushels, but if, if, if I'm using it, it's the fault of the UK. So, um, and uh, this, is, this is red chili. It's the same, same chili, actually. You can see that this chili here se está pintando. It's starting to turn a little bit red. Um, as soon as it starts to turn red, you can string it up and it'll keep turning red on its own off the plant. Some of you already know that. Um, and we, we dry this and we process that for year round use as well. Uh, a little different. We, uh, after it's dry, we clean it out. I have to clean cause it gathers dust. We, um, clean, the, we cut it open, clean the inside. We save all the inside. The little known fact, seeds, chili seeds are not hot. They're only hot because they're touching veins, right? The seeds themselves have no heat. Um, and so, but we, we harvest all that too. And we call it corazones. And it's this amazing flavor that you put on other kinds of foods, extra hot. And then we grind the red chili and, and use it for the, for the whole year. Um, this is my dad uh, in, his, in his typical sunny mood. Um, this is my brother who is actually sunny all the time. Um, and I'm something between the two of them, I think. And there's a friend who wanted to come at one point and see what we were doing. He had heard about it. Um, Last thing I'll say is about the pictures is um, this is me driving back home from, I'm, I live in San Antonio, Texas, uh, which is beautiful green, but not mountainous and very hot. And when I drive back to Northern New Mexico, which is mountainous, you, the, the peaks back here go up to 13,000 feet, which is something like, I don't know, 3,000 some, I don't know how many meters, but um, it just reminds me when I get to that geography that I'm coming back into a space that it, of someone else that I was or, or, or part of who I still am. And um, I just, I just, it's a nice reminder that here, here I come back into some other ways of knowing that I grew up with. So I'm a kid, originally a kid from Northern New Mexico. I'm a reformed accountant. I, I first got an accounting degree out of uh, pure laziness. You could say, uh, you could, you could choose a lazier path and get an accounting degree. That's what people have said that. I was like, no, no, no. No, because because in any other degree, if you get a, a uh, like a marketing degree or a history degree, and you don't do you don't get like straight A's, you can't get a job. As an accountant, you can be mediocre and still get a job. So I literally chose that. No, no kidding. That was the state of my my, my thinking at the at the time. I, I'll just say I was a late bloomer. Um, but I did that for for about three years, and and then eventually moved my way into what ended up being development studies. Um, I consider myself an action researcher and a community-based researcher, and I've been, in my own mind, in my own practice, moving into community-based thinking uh, from action research. Don't have a lot of time to talk about that, but um, that's how I see myself. I don't belong to a discipline, although I do believe we should put sociology, anthropology, and all the ologies back into the way we work, because professionalized education is killing that. Um, uh, but, uh, but I don't come from any specific discipline. I used to be a capacity building practitioner. That was my field in international development and until I realized, thanks to IDS, so I, maybe I should ask for my money back, that I didn't even care about capacity building. And I didn't even care about international development in the way that it was being practiced, at least in what I was working. But what I discovered through my journey here was that I did care about meaningful methodology that allowed me to connect to people in ways that allowed them to see new things about themselves and me to see new things about myself and, and, and find myself being a more useful helper and not just a creative facilitator. Um, so uh, I, be, I have become a seeker of meaningful methodology and I've, uh, I, I'm still a capacity building practitioner, but that's not the, doesn't hold as much meaning for me anymore. Um, and lastly, I am, and we'll be talking about this in the rest of my, my talk. I'm speaking a little bit faster because I'm trying to get the pace through so we can get through most of the material. Um, a radical epistemologist. And by that, all I mean is that me, like you, and us, we have multiple layers. And the goal of research is to connect to each other, to reveal unleashed knowledges. 
uh, to leverage those knowledges for good use. And to do so, we need to have cultural bridges to each other that go beyond our professional personas or go beyond our categories as whatever we are, how we see each other. And um, this is why many of you in probably some of the work you do in participatory methods, but I for sure try to use methods that reveal our multiplicities. And maybe that creates a possible bridge for to someone else to see, oh, we're from a different religion. We're from a different part of the world, but I identify with you at a level of farming or I identify with you at a level of child raising, whatever, it, whatever the situation is. So um, I never think of any of these things, even when we do them in, in, as activities, I never think of them as, as icebreakers. I think of them as potential conversation starters to talking about the real things. All right. Um, I won't say much about my time here. It was very important to me. Uh, I came in uh, a, bur a bur kind of a frustrated practitioner, uh, feeling, feeling like a lot of the work I had done was creative yet superficial. And I was seeking something more meaningful. And uh, uh, I was part of the, at the time it was called the Participation, Power and Social Change Team. And I did three action research projects, uh, two, in, two in Peru and one in Ecuador. Um, and each action research project, I worked with an activist organization, a community development organization, and a conservation organization. And for each, we had a research question that was meaningful to them. But I was also looking at something beyond that. I was trying to, I was trying to figure out what is meaningful methodology that allows people to grapple with complex environments, with their complexity. So tying it to complexity theory and things we do in a place like this. Um, and I was ultimately asking the question, how might we strengthen capacities differently in complex environments? What, what, would, that, what would that capacity building approach be that was different if we were actually taking into account complexity and that the, world, the change, is, change is not linear? Um, action research had a lot of answers to this question. And so I built a lot of what I did on, on, on that. Um, two quick anecdotes. Peter Taylor, some of you met him, was, was my supervisor. And he kept asking me early on, what is your question? You know, what is your question? But, and I was like, damn it, I, I need to find the question. Um, and I found the question by the time I was done. Uh, and I realized later that if you have a good topic and you have an engaged process, you can do meaningful research. And the questions emerge along the way. And then I discovered later, constructivist grounded theory says, you shouldn't even have a question. Or avoid looking at uh, using bringing theories in in advance because I guarantee you're going to find them when when you go out in the field. Um, so there were so many other things that that I learned about how to learn about things um, that I appreciated by being exposed to those here here at IDS. Um, and last thing too, for those of you, any of you who are how many are doing a thesis of some kind or a field project, either masters or or PhD level, or I know a couple of people are, because I know there's some MAP students in here. Yeah, they don't want to raise their hands. They just don't know yet. Um, in retrospect, I probably didn't need to do three action research projects. I wish someone had told me that. But I learned more for it, but I probably did more than I needed to. <laughs> OK, so um, what does it mean? And this is going to be the focus of my, of my talk, is 500 hats. But really, the question we're asking is, what does it mean to be a scholar when working with community-based research? Um, what is it that we do that is different from a pure practitioner and different also from a pure researcher? Uh, what is that hybrid? And how can we recognize the things we actually do and therefore we need skills and capacity for? And how can we then rethink the way we train ourselves? This is a picture, a series of pictures that um, from a process I worked in in, uh, in Peru. Uh, post PhD, but where I got to apply some of the methodological principles I designed in my dissertation, and um, I, I, I like this series of pictures because this com th this comes from a moment at the end of the process where we were making sense out of whether or not what we had done together what had been participatory enough, and we were doing a s systematization of experiences, which some of you have heard of. Um, but it's basically a systematic reconstruction of the experience for purposes of theorizing from it from the ground up. And I just love it because it's it's working with creative methods and tools. It's sitting around having conversations. It's 
conviviendo, spending time together, uh, space together, and constructing meaning as, as we work together. Um, but it's a combination of doing and the things you might do typically in a workshop setting, but also, th also thinking. We're very intentionally using tools to document and leave a trail of breadcrumbs that we could learn from on a more deeper level than just a typical workshop. And so a lot of the scenes are people really grappling with things, doing creative drawings, but also analyzing. And um, I know many of you do a lot of this work, but I, I love that part, that particular set of workshops um, really played out in a, in, a, in a nice way. So that's that's why I think of, of that when I think of community-based research in my case. Um, I've kind of already said this. So what what is community-based? What is our work look like when we're working with communities? Um, what roles do we find ourselves playing? In other words, what hats do we wear? And um, what would a whole scholar curriculum look like that really takes into account everything we do? And so it's important to ask the question, and I'm gonna ask you in a second with a little, a little uh, poll we're gonna do. Um, what is the work? What is this thing we call research or that we call action research or community-based research? Um, what do we actually do in the field? And I just have some images here that I pulled that were both instructive, but also free. And so, you know, maybe a typical, uh, this, is a, this is a journey map from using uh, service design. Um, juggling, I just think juggling is something that we do, maybe in different forms, but I like that image. And then I threw up there also a scientist looking through this, uh, his or her um, microscope, because that's part of it too. But we're going to see in a second that if, if we can think of the work we do in four or five categories, I call them realms. Me and Mary Bride Miller call them realms. Only one of those categories or realms is formal research. Yet most of what we do in training spaces is focused on that. And how does this change as we think dynamically about our research process too? So I'm not gonna cover this in detail, but this is from uh, Barbara Israel and her colleagues, uh, kind of phases of an action research partnership where here she's going from forming a partnership all the way to uh, dis translating and disseminating research findings and going back into cycles. How do those questions around what we end up doing roles wise change in different phases of the work? And to what extent is our education preparing us for thinking in terms of process phase, uh, understanding where you are and pulling it together? We find, and we so Mary Bride Miller and I, in 2018, we were tasked with writing a chapter on the roles of action researchers. And she had in advance, she said, I think we need to call it the 500 hats. And she wanted to connect it to uh, Dr. Seuss, particular book called The 500 Hats of Bartholomew Cubbins. If you go read the book after, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be like, you're completely misusing the metaphor. <laughs> so uh, just don't read the book or do, because I don't want to discourage you from reading the book, but know that we just took it as a simple idea. And what we did was we, we laid out stories of what we did in specific action research projects, her in one, I think, and me in two. And then we analyzed that, our story, and we found that what we were doing was organizing, educating, sometimes facilitating, analyzing data, mediating, etc., making coffee, uh, stirring the pot, problematizing, being a friend, listening, being a strategist, a, a witness in some cases, a provocateur, et cetera. We were doing so many things and that's the work. Are we, as we generate knowledge from all these things that we're doing, are we even gathering that data or is that not, are we trained to not look at that part of it and only look at the narrow things that have been predefined as the research work? All right. Um, again, it's gonna be a little quick because this is an hour and 15 minute space, but um, I do wanna at least get a little bit of your voice into this. And so I'm going to ask you to go to this link. And I think, do, will our, our online people can do the same thing, right? They should, yeah. Right, okay. So um, you can either go, if, if it's easier for you, you can go to 
bit.ly forward slash IDS hats, or you can just do that with a phone or whatever. And hopefully it's not taking you anywhere yet because I haven't started the presentation. Is it? Yeah. Can I see, can I see someone? Can someone show me? Does it allow you to answer? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. All right. It's okay. But it just takes you to the first one. Okay. That's fine. All right. So is everyone there? Because I'm going to take, I'm going to take it off the screen and show the results part of it. Okay. Everyone's there? Good. All right. So, um, this is was my best way of trying to just get who are you, right? So I respond with some aspect of who you are, some aspect of your identity, your own Chile, green Chile, northern New Mexico story. Um, just go ahead and start responding, and we'll see who we have in the room and online. I now know that I have offended the political scientist with my dismissive language. I apologize for that. Nice, got a learner in here, an intersectional feminist. Confused, then I've done my job. Connector, community member, different roles that we play. An accomplice, I often see myself as an accomplice too. Project manager. Outdoor enthusiast. What's that? Mexican? Father, a flirt, uh-oh. Passionate teacher, production engineer. Peace builder, nice, we need more of those. Singer. I believe we have a second confused. Nice. Lost lamb. It would be inappropriate for me to ask who the lost lamb is, but I, I would love to have that conversation. A human curious friend researcher. I love the way those words came together in the middle. Cool. Let's ask another question. What does community mean to you? When you hear those terms, community, what does that mean? So community as solidarity, belonging, collective, not just collective, but collective action, bonding, nice, hope and empathy, home, evolving, multiple communities, a safe space for doing. A place where we look for each other. Compromise. Find my identity, shared identity. Proximity, roots. Well, let's ask another question. With which communities do you engage? So you can think of that as communities of place, communities of interest, whatever, however you understand community. Who do each of you engage with? Which communities do you engage with? Including your research.
in a parallel universe, they're using this, uh, they're doing this exact same presentation in a hyper conservative space. And someone just typed in left wing family members. <laughs> so we're engaging in communities of social entrepreneurs, food systems, um, marginalized more generally, family, online, working with oppressor castes, marginalized women, academia, bureaucrats, feminists, frontline service providers, activists, youth, women, Twitter, queer people. So we are certainly out working in the world. How do you engage community knowledge? What are the things you do in your work to engage community knowledge? How do you do it? What tools do you use? What do you do? We might have an anthropologist in here, immersion, some good, some good ethnography. Listening, mind mapping, talking to people, theater, methods like Augusto Boal, focus groups, asking tough questions, protesting, nice, it's a really powerful way of knowing. Listening, using public narrative, a lot of visual. Action research, following people that have different viewpoints, Dialogue, connecting in meetings, challenging norms. Documenting protests. So not just doing the protests, but documenting. Welcome. Holding space. We don't have to always have the methodology, just create a space. Being uncomfortable. Systems mapping, photography. A lot of use of visual and performative methodologies in participatory research. You yourself being a safe space. Queer love. Nice. Participatory video. Uh, how many questions have I asked? Is that four? Okay. I hope. Okay, let me see. Give me, give me a second. Okay, I'm gonna turn it, but don't don't do anything. Ah. Actually, that is correct. Last question. When you do that doing, that research, that being present, that engaging with people, what hats do you wear? What roles do you find yourself playing? Okay. Sometimes we play the role of expert. Sometimes the community member, organizer, facilitator, friend, project manager, sounding board, counselor, furniture arranger. <laughs> Director, instructor, accompanier, uh, convener, Meaning maker, sharing of privilege, teacher, data collector, knowledge broker, empathizer, ally. Yeah. 
if this is what we do, why is this not our academic training? It is in certain things, the data, not the data analyst side, the, the, the so some of the more formal research stuff, but okay. I'm gonna stop that, come back here. So if we're wearing so many hats, why are we only training in one realm, the academic researcher? Again, with exception of, and I say this completely with knowledge of MAP, with very few exceptions, but exceptions like MAP. But why are we spending two years, five years, focused on one realm of the work that we do when we need skills for all those other things, yet we don't want to spend time on them? Um, Mary and I, when we pulled together our, the different roles that we played in, in the examples we had in that particular article, we found that the things we did fit into four different realms. If we took the ideas you just threw up there, there may be new realms. So we're not, we're not saying that these are the realms, but these are realms that were present in our work, which included the realm of being empathetic relators. I saw a lot of listening, sounding board, kindness, um, learning how to listen learning how to be present for a long period of time and, and be an ally. Um, realm of emergent designers, because as we poke at the world, as we do things with people, as we take action, the world reacts back and says, you can't possibly stick to your original plan, otherwise you've learned nothing. So we redesign as we go, those of us who embrace that. The realm of dynamic sense makers, <clears throat> what's going on? What do we do next? What do other people think is going on? How do we figure out what's going on in a given situation and figure out how to, how to emerge in, uh, similar to the previous one? And also a realm of advocacy, a realm of a desired change, of intended change. We know that action research is research through action and for action. Its purpose is not to generate knowledge as a primary purpose, sorry. It is also to generate knowledge. Its purpose is to leverage knowledge to inform and, and contribute to change. Um, so that fits in maybe within the realm of advocacy and, and change and social change. Um, so this is these are some realms we could be designing curriculum around and other realms that make more sense to your experience. All right, I'm gonna share, let me just do a little time check. So um, because of the fire alarm, Luckily, that gives me an extra 15 minutes. I'm joking. Um, uh, this goes until up to 2. Is that correct? 12.32, but people, and a little before that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to share a, a, a recent case from my experience um, to just think about some new layers of potential roles and realms of, of action research and see if that takes us anywhere. So, oh, and I've got a couple of these, and I have a couple of extra if people want them. Um, this is part of a project uh, that we worked on the last th three years. Uh, well, this part, this part of it, the last two years, and it was uh, funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is a the biggest uh, health philanthropy in the United States, and <clears throat> excuse me. They were, they're part of a, um, a movement in foundations of supporting more community-based work and, and participatory work and showing up in their RFPs and their RFAs consistently over time. I know there's something similar going on here with the, remind me, Joe, the name of the, uh, you, you told me <clears throat> um, here too in the UK, there's a move towards um, with, with certain uh, governmental funding towards more participatory engaged process, you, 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 equitable partnerships. So I don't know how big the movement is, but certainly in the United States with some of the private foundations and with federal government, CDC, there's a move towards more participatory process. And the problem is these organizations are working with the same researchers that have never worked in that way before. And in some cases, they're trying to reach out to community engaged um, actors that do work in participatory ways, but they don't really leave a trail behind them. They don't really document so much or theorize from their experience. 
And so um, we were able to get a grant to try out, to, to work with participatory methodologies, which I've been doing for a long time, but, but to try it out in specific settings in, in uh, related to health equity and to document how they work. So we're trying to achieve impact, sure, but we're really trying to better explain how do these ways of working in participatory ways change the knowledge dynamics, change what can be known, change who gets involved, change how likely people are to keep working in this way. So that's what we were looking for. And uh, one of the projects that came up was with breastfeeding women. And this was tied to our partnership with the city of San Antonio. They'll come up here in a second. Um, actually, they're up there right now. So let me, let me just come up here. So we, we ended up with a zine called, that we call Sembrando Amor. And this, Sembrando Amor is an in vivo code. It's, it was named by one of the participants as she explained her breastfeeding journey as a process in which the, she's from, uh, she's a Afro Honduran. And she explained in beautiful detail um, how mother, child, and grandmother are one. They're literally the same thing. Um, and so, so to benefit one is to sembrar amor for the entire unity. Um, and the way she explained it, if nothing else, gave people a different way of thinking about breastfeeding. And so there's a lot of that, but we, we were like, can we, could we, could we call the whole zine? Cause it has five different community members. Community experts is the term that the city uses, uh, stories. And so we ended up with, with this, with this zine. Um, the, who are the who are the actors? The five community experts are Shakira, uh, Danielle, Luisana, Yanina, she's the one who coined this, and Nadezhda. Um, there was a broader team, so going through the cartoon. So don't forget the broader team, which was City of San Antonio's Healthy Neighborhoods Program, Public Health, uh, the City, City of San Antonio's Health Department, which included Chongmin, Anayanse, Delia, Yvonne, and uh, Paola. Got to correct that. It's a O, not a U. Um, and then from the University of Incarnate Word, my university, Judy Ann, CG, and me. Um, and part of what came out, and this we'll see in a second, this comes out of the results, a lot of sharing of adverse experiences in terms of breastfeeding to people of color. And, and that's they came out in these stories. So here I'm just retelling what came out. So we know that people of color have mixed experiences in breastfeeding. And this is Steve who is the cartoonist, professional cartoonist, but you're gonna see in a second that there's a community version of it as well. And we agreed at every, at every step um, to, to turn, to create a professionalized version of it. Um, so the mothers told us through the stories that they enter into a scary world after childbirth. Um, and at the same time, they experience a health system that often lacks empathy. And in some cases, pushes formula on them. Very little patience and pushes formula very quickly. I'm not gonna present this. This is just to show that we're taking out of the stories, which are very close to the original form that they were told in, we're, we're we are pulling meaning out of it that we can use for, for advocacy purposes. But this was created for an event in Austin, Texas of community health workers where the community experts went to present. So um, we're processing, but we're, we're, um, we're keeping things in a form that the community experts feel their story is still there. They can speak confidently to the, to the result and they can be at least the co-presenters in advocating or sharing the knowledge in spaces that are meant to influence public health providers but also um, breastfeeding service providers who also can be come sometimes paternalistic and not terribly in tune with the, the pace of, of the mother's learning. So Sembrando Amor is a story about all of this, but we captured it mostly in, in cartoon. All right, so the stories revealed deeper traumas as well, including legacies from slavery and we, here we say, see Shakira's story. So if you can, and I, if those, if they're not for anyone, I can send you the PDF as well. Um, Shakira shared in her story that um, she had had four kids and had not breastfed any of them. And we spoke about in the, in the, in the circles of 
a lot of challenges that African Americans in particular have in breastfeeding because of taboos related to breasts. Um, not everyone, but documented and known. And it came out in the conversation. Uh, she, by chance, happened to be learning about slavery for the first time in her life, actually studying it. And when she learned about the facts of black women being forced to deliver their milk to white masters' uh, kids, um, she, she woke up and she said, I must breastfeed my fifth child. And her, her story is about that. So if, when you see in, in, in this zine, you, you see that. So um, these stories, which were just everyday stories, um, not, sorry, they were, they were stories that the community experts thought needed to be told and heard by other people, um, were full of things that have to do with poor treatment in health care system, but also deeper things like legacies of slavery. But a lot of other things came out too. People of color also have deep knowledge and wisdom, obvious statement, but I'm using the cartoon simplistic form to tell this, that is passed on from culturally, sometimes from grandmothers, mothers, cultural practices, et cetera. And that comes out very strongly in two or three of the stories. Um, they inherently know how to sow the seeds of love through breastfeeding. And then the connection, which is the reason the city wanted to work on breastfeeding in the first place is because with healthy kids, you can not only improve the health outcomes of a group of people, but actually break cycles of inequity. How do we know this down here on the bottom left-hand corner? Well, we asked them to share their stories. Um, and how, how did we do that? We started with a community-based action research photo voice process, which we're gonna see didn't go as well as we thought. Um, and to center their knowledge, we tried to move at the pace of the community experts and even let the focus of the project emerge with them and not be predetermined. And then Steve asks me, were you successful? Because he entered in at the zine phase. He wasn't there uh, early on. Not always. Well, what happened? One time, the community experts needed more time. It was a period of time in which they were busy with family. Uh, a couple had some uh, tragedy. Uh, there was a period of time where, in spite of being committed to this project that was run by the city, but and we were part of it, um, they couldn't be around. They couldn't show up. It was like a two-month hiatus. We had to kind of take a break. But we, as an, as the broader action research team, we didn't want to sit idle. We're like, well, we can keep working. Um, so we we took the knowledge we created up to that point, which included some of the recordings from the bit from the the joint meetings together. It included. A, couple of uh, interviews based on porch visits where we showed up at their houses and kind of had them walk us through a few things, uh, which included also them uh, creating captions and copy for their pictures for a photo voice exhibit. But we tried to make it more convenient by showing up to have to have them do it there in their own homes. Um, so we had a lot of data, a lot of narrative from their experience. And so we created, we said, hey, you take this one, you take this one, you take this one. Let's create little models of interesting things that are coming out from what they're saying so far. And here's an, just an example of one of the models, right? Um, issues around uh, pandemic breastfeeding, this fourth trimester idea, lack of hospital support, struggles with breastfeeding itself, and then some positive things around support from family and community, and then more generally the impacts of the pandemic. We did this because we wanted to keep busy and because we had an implicit idea still in our heads, even though I know better, um, that everyone doesn't want to do everything. Everyone doesn't want to play every role. There is a role occasionally for a researcher to do researchy things, right? Um, and so we figured, well, let's just create some of these models and we'll present them back to them and it'll all be fine. So that assumption that they didn't want to participate in the research activities, Steve here asked, was that true? No, it wasn't true. And they asked why they weren't included. And that this generated a lot of good internal discussion in the broader team and even conflict. Because it came to a point where one group of people on our, on our broader team was saying, we can't do anything without community approval. Can't take one step. 
Others were saying, well, that's a good idea. Um, we do have different roles. We can negotiate different things. We can figure out a way to work together. It caused conflict because those two positions were very strong and not listening to each other very much. Um, but what came out was a, 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 a unique insight, I thought, which was that even if we can do responsible processes where we negotiate with people who does what, who wants to do what, uh, how, do we, how do we negotiate participation in ways that are community-centered, who gives us the right to decide when to do that? And so we have so much power often as external researchers, action researchers, elites in many cases, to decide when to, to invite participation, to decide to invite it at every moment or not to, to decide that we can just negotiate roles. And the hard black and white position of you must consult them and ask them for at every single step, which before sounded unreasonable and like too much of a idealistic way of thinking, at a minimum became a critical question to say, who's allowed to, who's allowed to convene? What right do we have to be able to answer that question for other people? And so um, that came out of the process. And we should have known better for another reason. Early in the process, we had asked them, this, this, our, our colleagues at the city had asked them, what, why are you doing this? What do you want to do with this process? And almost every single one of them had expressed a desire to turn their story into influence. And these are mostly women of not very good economic means and living in uh, not the best uh, areas of the, of the city, some, some high insecurity areas of the city of San Antonio, but they knew why they were doing this and they had already expressed that they were trying to change things. And yet we just didn't think to consult them at a key moment. Sorry, these are the names of the community experts and these are some of the things they had declared as what they're trying to do themselves, what their own goals were with this project. So we had to ask ourselves, what did we really mean by equitable participation and who gets to, who gets to convene this conversation? And we had neglected to invite participation every turn. At one point, we even brought in uh, a framework um, that, that, that created more conflict, <laughs> the team, uh, that was from the IAP2, I forgot what that means, but it has different levels. It, it's another way of looking at participation that goes from inform, consult, involve, collaborate, empower. I don't like this framework because I, I have, as a lot of people do, I have problems with the term empower. But the point was it forced us to look at are we really being ethically participatory? And the community experts were wondering if they were even being heard. So while our photo voice process at that point, which had successfully generated good feeling, built community within the team, the, including you know, the, the broader team, the community voice was still missing. So an interesting outcome of us doing the wrong thing and the conflict that emerged was we had to stop and say, so what do we do? How do, how do we recenter this? How do we find an avenue where you can feel like your voice is coming out? Because they looked at the photo voice, we all looked at the photo voice, the pictures, they were really nice, they were evocative, some nice copy, and no one felt like it was really expressing what they wanted to express. And so we could say the photo voice process didn't work, or, or it did work, it led us to something different. Um, and so we ended up, we asked, we came to the group and said, what should we do? And after exploring different options together, we found a really cool zine on breastfeeding. And we had a bunch of different pictures of things we could do, photo, photo novellas, all kinds of different things. And the group said, no, let's do, let's do zines. And I, I, uh, I have a friend, Steve Kroger, who's an action researcher also, who's a cartoonist and he, he would be willing to help us. And so, um, so they said, let's do a cartoon zine featuring the stories we really want to tell. And that, that became this. So with Steve's help, we invited the community experts to sketch out um, a storyboard and that Steve could help refine it. And here too, I'm not going to cover this. This was a cartoon he created to help them 
big, to help them see that they could create a cartoon. And it worked in some cases, not in others, but at every, at every step we tried to figure out how do we lower the, the barriers to entry? And I don't mean in terms of intellectual capacity. I mean, in terms of ep epistemic ways of presenting things, creating languages, spaces, visuals, storyboards that every human can do or most humans can do. Um, so we know Frere and many others told us a long time ago that Gramsci, that every human expresses complex knowledge, philosophizes and theorizes every single day just to survive. It's the language that excludes them. And so we were trying to find languages that allowed people to express their complex ideas. This is two of, uh, two of the community experts did their cartoon, a regular one. Another one um, <clears throat> created a storyboard but didn't do a cartoon. And the two others asked us if we could interview them and us create a story from that. Um, so this is um, each contributed in different ways. And um, uh, together we created the Sembrano Morzin, uh, to fulfill the community experts' desire to inform, advocate, and change systems, which is from their previous slide that I, sh I shared with you. And in the process, we, we went through with this thing called going from storytelling to story doing, where community people can tell a story of their experience, see that their story contains expertise because it takes, a, takes on a tangible form, see that there's connection between their story and other people's stories and can have opportunities and spaces to take their story then and use it to, to strike up a conversation, to advocate, or even just embolden themselves to demand better services in some cases. And so um, at every step from there on, we designed everything with them. Even the layout of one of the events we did at the public library we had a pre-event where we created this sketch with the community experts, basically. And th this was full, but I just trying to show you, show you the layout of the, of the event there. So in that little story that I just shared, um, I just expressed a, a lot of other things that we did that went well beyond anything I was trained in in my university experiences around research. Um, so I'm not going to go into that, but you have in your mind some of the things that you might have heard um, that went beyond traditional research. Certainly, we were emergent designers in having to adapt to something that wasn't working and say, well, that didn't work. Photo voice wasn't the right thing, or maybe it was, but we didn't use it the right way. Um, let's find another pathway. Um, we got all the way to advocacy and creating spaces for the participants to come in and share their stories directly. We have these elaborate photo voice exhibits with these cartoons on boards in big form and inviting in service providers, of different kinds to come in and directly engage with the, the women and their experiences. Um, we got to, we, we were pretty empathetic from the beginning, but then made a mistake. But that empathetic base gave us the ability to, to, to withstand the conflicts um, and we were trying to make sense of it throughout because it was pushing a lot of us outside of our comfort zones. So what is the curriculum for that? And I'm not going to cover this, but next week in Manchester, we're, we're going to present versions of this. Uh, we have four different presentations, each with a separate cartoon. This was really focused on community voice. We have a different one on community power, working with co-ops in Dayton. Um, co-creation and then knowledge democracy and co-control, which is an article that me and a couple others just wrote for ATD Fourth World. Um, if this is the work that we're trying to do, if this is the world we're trying to create, where's the curriculum for that? Knowing that this is one of the best places that asks these same questions. I want to be clear about that. I'm not going to cover this either, and I probably shouldn't put big complex diagrams in front of you and then say I'm not going to cover it. But we're in the process, we, uh, we have a book project, me and, me and Mary Bright Miller and uh, Miriam Rader Roth, um, where we've been asked to write, the, and it, we did not come up with the term a modern guide. Edward Elger Publishing Company is putting out these modern guides on different things, and they asked us to do one on action research. Um, and in the process, we put together a lot of ideas to share out and get feedback. Joe gave us feedback, a couple others did too. Um, and this just, this just shows 
the range of topics that we're dealing with when we're talking about action research, which includes, of course, participation and co-creation, but rethinking the nature of knowledge production, the form knowledge takes, who, who creates it, and how we can start creating knowledge projects that are products that are much closer to the original story that people can still identify with and don't get lost in translation to a research product. Even though those research products can also still be useful, there's a whole science that we need to work on, on creating these things to make them useful and usable. Uh, these, and, and knowledge in general, I don't mean just zines. Um, everything has to do with multiple ways of knowing. Extending epistemology meet multiple ways of knowing. Um, action research that, that aggregates and looks at both micro and macro. Um, action research that's directly tied to the ter terrible challenge with climate change uh, and, and war and conflict. Etc. So, I, I'll share this article again. It's, it's a little bit the article is dated, but we're 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 reworking on it now. So it's, we're doing adding a lot of stuff to it. But um, we created an initial set of ideas around if these are the realms that we work in, and it's an incomplete list. What are the dispositions and ethics that we each need to have? What are the skills we need to have? And then what would be training implications for that? So I'm not gonna. I'm not going to go through all these here, but uh, we've broken this down into these four realms um, of advocacy, empathetic relating. We combined dynamic sense making and emergent designing. And then don't forget traditional research. We're not downplaying the force of tra traditional research. We're just saying this can't be 90% of what we're being trained on. All right, so coming to the end here. Um, but I'm going to ask you for one more uh, little response on that Mentimeter. Um, so what would a master's or PhD curriculum look like? And I, I put action research because that's my world, but activist research, engaged research, uh, however you want to think about it, look like that prepares students to smartly wear 500 hats in the work that we'll actually engage in, but also that prepares us to be adaptive to what people actually want and need, it may not be what we're currently doing. What does that curriculum look like? And so let's go back to, do you still have that uh, thing up? Did it go to the next one? Oh, that's so nice of it to wait for me. Okay, and sorry for using PhD. It could be master's level too, just graduate. I'm, I am thinking graduate level. What would the characteristics be of a graduate program that prepares us to wear the 500 hats we actually need to wear in the field that respond to the work we actually do and that respond to what we want to need? What are some of those characteristics? You just throw a few answers up there. <clears throat> But we need more training and compassion and care, active listening, facilitating. That's huge. That came out in some of our work. Design thinking, inciting, sitting with and resolving conflict, project management, holding space, more facilitation, logistics, how to not exclude with language, bureaucratic processes, innovative presentation methods, Deeply engaging the personal and political through self-reflexivity. New techniques of participatory research that don't become just creative methods but are, retain their power as meaningful methods. Shadowing action researchers, great idea. Collapsing the chasms between art practice and research. I double and I second and, and uh, yes. Um, what methods allow us to bypass our normal frames of relating? Use those. Art of listening, navigating power, trauma-informed approaches. Uh, I, many of you know the restorative practice is 
coming becoming bigger and bigger in an action research kind of space. Um, and it's pretty powerful. All right, let me see, I think that's it. Oh, um, Mary would be upset if I didn't include this. So um, I don't remember that. I now, now I shouldn't have included this. I don't remember the context, but this was at a party she had at her house and she was so proud. Where is Mary? Oh, there's Mary. So some, Mary Bride Miller has been um, a close friend and colleague of mine for like 12 years. I, th I think you might even know her more, longer than I have, Joe, right? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but um, she's kind of decided, I met her in the Action Research Journal board. I had just finished my PhD. I, I started academia a little bit later, but I had I was a new academic. And she said, I want to work with you. And thanks to, that, to her, I've gotten to write so many things and had so many opportunities um, that I wouldn't have had if I had just done the traditional, let me submit a bunch of articles to blind peer review processes. And um, so I think that's another tied to the shadowing thing. Um, I She did that for me. She's not that much older than me, but she is older than me. Intergenerational passing on of knowledge, working together, partnering um, is something that we should be working on in our curriculums as well. Any questions or comments? You know, I pelted you with knowledge, with uh, ideas, yeah. I work a lot with like caregivers for the incarcerated and we've been developing a zine together, a digital zine. And this is sort of the first time that I'm doing something like this. A lot of my research has been more traditional in nature and I wanted to break away from that. Um, and now that I'm coming to the close of the project that I'm working on, I'm thinking about what happens after like i know we've come a really long way from traditional research and seeing the people that we work with as subjects and you know a lot of what you spoke about goes into that and like thinking about the power dynamics of subject and researcher and so on but what are some of the ways that you engage with the communities that you work with beyond just the project um and you know how might i learn from that yeah um, that came up in the earlier session we had this morning. Um, we're, we're trying to, we're trying to accept the responsibility that comes with engaging with a community who's willing to share their stories in some cases, willing to let you also help in something they want to do, but that comes the responsibility too, um, which is to try to be committed to that cause. And so in the autism case, which I didn't really talk about much here, but in the autism case, we're, we're working on going with them through relationships we have with a nonprofit organization and some of members of our own team have kids with autism. And so we're, we're showing that we're still working with that group, even when the project funding is not active. With, the, with this project, it's tied to the city of San Antonio and they're committed institutionally longer term to certain communities. So there's some continuity, some continuity there. Uh, so that's definitely the goal. So I want to, that's the most important thing. But it's also okay if there's an agreement to say, we're not, this is not meant to be a sustainable project. This is meant to be a learning process whereby we all think we can get something out of this is useful and if it goes on further, that's great, but we're okay if it if it has a really good moment and we can learn from it. Mm -hmm. I saw someone else had a question or a comment. Joe. Thanks. Um thank you, Alfred. That's brilliant. Um very thought provoking. One thing that I was wondering about is conflict so we're never going to be able to make a perfect process and we also know that being that emergence is necessary so we can't pre-guess everything um and i thought it was really useful that you 
recognize when conflict happened in that process and that you had to rethink and do something with it. So I'd just like to hear a bit more about how you understand conflict in community because we all came out with these lovely words about community, right? <laughs> but there are conflicts and tensions and particularly, not particularly, there are conflicts and tensions. So um, how do you, do you see that as something to work with? Um, could you tell us a bit more about conflict? Oh, over to Mariah. Sorry, can I just add on to that? Just to say, um, you mentioned when you were talking about the conflict, you also mentioned that there had been kind of a previous stage of relationship building that helped you navigate that conflict. And I wondered if in answering Joe's question, you could also kind of talk a little bit about that and its role in how you do action research. Yeah, um, the, this process started during the, 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 the strongest part of the COVID. So that had us working mostly online, uh, but we we had, I don't know how long it was, I'm gonna say three to five months of these Zoom meetings to start sharing the pictures. We used Padlet to create to use to create the photo voice exhibit. Um, and the community experts that we we're working with, ex experts in breastfeeding, um, they weren't all technologically savvy. And in some cases, we had to have a, a member of the city of San Antonio's health neighborhoods team alongside with one of them in their space. Um, later on, we masked up, but um, we just, we went really slow. Like we, we accomplished in traditional terms so little in each one of those meetings because uh, we were all okay with figuring out are people understanding what we're doing here? Is this what we want to do? And over time, um, at the end of each meeting, even though you didn't see a lot of energy like you typically see with active participants, we'd do a checkout and they were so grateful to be hearing, talking to other women, to be talking about this, to just be able to be away from being tied to their child the whole day. And so they kept saying, this is very meaningful, let's keep doing this. And over time we realized like what was silence and a worry that maybe this just wasn't resonating was actually just people figuring out how to get warmed up, how to feel like they fit in and, and feeling like we were a group together. That created a lot of trust. And when the when the conflict came later, the conflict was mostly within our own team of the, between the city because we were hearing about the dissonance of the community experts around not having been included from the city of San Antonio's side. And we believed it to be true. But then we had the, this deep debate on you, we can't be so exaggerated as to every single step, everything we ask for, every little permission. Um, and then the other side saying, well, you have to, you know. Um, so if not for that history of relating, including uh, longer term relationships with some of us on the UIW city team, the conflict got ugly enough that it could have blown up and permanently damaged relationships. So I think the, and some members mediated, you know, um, I think if not for the huge amount of time invested in making sure people felt comfortable, heard, and going slowly enough, you know, not, not feeling so productivist, we wouldn't have withstood that conflict. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I'll say one last thing, which is tied to what the, this morning, the morning session that I facilitated was, was focused on, which is the, the, the way we work in action research and participatory research is more than a means to an end. We're tr we work in ways, the methods we choose are trying to mimic the, the reality that we wish to see in the world. By inviting participation, we're not just trying to get better knowledge, better research, we're trying to enact participatory values that we want to be the reality. And so um, <clears throat> because of that, you can measure results at a given point, but the real, just as important is the result of people want to keep working together. People feel like they're heard. People want to continue having a voice and join in on different things. And so those are outcomes too. So because means and ends are not that different in action research, we need to learn how to explain that. 
and then we need to be able to um, explain that also in academic terms so that people can understand that it's not just a creative, potentially better way of getting people's knowledge. And it's often way less efficient than other means, even though the quality of the knowledge can be better. And so we need to have the arguments for that. And um, um, we also need to have arguments on how experience becomes story, the data, whatever you want to call it, becomes evidence, becomes artifacts, um, and is used in change processes, used in advocacy processes, used in whatever process, and how it's being used in ways that the originators uh, can still see their voice. And so that's a whole theory of learning that we don't spend enough time documenting or theorizing to explain to the world either. And so um, the top the, a, a category to call it is the missing middle theory in action research. But if we want people to uptake this way of working, we have to explain that stuff, the, the, the in-between stuff and how it changes learning dynamics. So I think you're in a great intellectual learning space that also allows you to be touching people's lives and, and uh, um, trying to work in this way and enact that world, but you also need to help explain it. So please explain as you go and see that as part of your work uh, that you do out in the field. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, I do. I mean, I feel 